Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is ferrite. Now ferrite based components come in two main flavors. On the one side you have energy storage and transfer components like power transformers and power inductors. And on the other side you have filtering components, ferrites, chokes and common mode chokes. And the thing is, is there really a difference? I mean, these are two separate categories of components with very separate roles in a circuit. And to get to the bottom of this, what I want to do today is look at one of the main properties of ferrites and magnetic materials in general. And that is their permeability. Both the real one and also the imaginary one. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So what is permeability? Well, one way to put it is that a material that has a higher permeability will allow the formation of a higher amount of magnetic flux density for the same amount of magnetic field strength. And one of the applications of this comes with inductors in general. Let me give you an example. So what I have here is a multimeter that can measure inductance and I've inserted an inductor into its probes. Now, the meter is showing minus 2 microhenry at the moment, and that is because I couldn't really find a way to calibrate it, and the zero point is minus 11 microhenry for whatever reason, but that doesn't really matter. Point is, if we insert a material that has a different permeability into the inductor, so different than air, which has a relative permeability of 1, so if I insert this ferrite rod, we can see that the inductance of my inductor has changed radically. So it increased by about 4 times. Originally it was around 10 microhenry, so minus 11 to minus 1 is like 10, and then an extra 30, so that's 4 times more, the total is about 40 microhenry. So by changing the permeability of the environment around the inductor, we can change its inductance value. Now the actual change in inductance doesn't just have to do with the permeability of the new material, but also how much of the space around the inductor is filled with the new material. So what I have here are some iron pieces. If I put one of these into my inductor, I go up to 33. If I put another one, I go up to 33. And if I insert another two, so double the amount, I go up to 45. So it's not enough just to insert a new material, you need to fill up as much space as possible. So the final value of inductance for an inductor has to do with the inductor's geometry and construction, how many turns there are, its physical dimensions, its diameter, its thickness and so on, but it also has to do with the permeability of the environment around it and all of the environment around it needs to be taken into consideration. So even though iron has a permeability of around 200, I did not increase my inductance by 200 times because I didn't fill up all the space around the inductor with iron. Now, speaking about iron, you may have noticed that inductors built with an iron core are usually used in energy transfer devices like transformers only at 50 or 60 Hertz and well in audio equipment up to 20 kilohertz, but that's it. You do not use iron as a core for high frequencies. Usually you go with ferrite. So what's wrong with iron? Why wouldn't you use it? Well to figure that out we need to look at how the permeability of iron is affected by frequency. Now one of the methods that you can use to measure inductance is explained in this application note written by Tektronics. Basically you insert a signal into a circuit that you've built with a reference resistor whose value is known, but also your unknown component. And basically what you do is you measure the signal that's inserted into the signal in point A1, but also the signal that is present on your tested component in point A2. And you need two pieces of information out of this measurement. 
First of all, you need the amplitude difference between the two signals. So how much smaller is signal A2 compared to signal A1? But you also need the phase difference between the two. And then you have some formulas explained in this document that you can use to process the data. And finally, what you end up with is the pure resistive element of your tested component and the pure reactive element. So for an inductor, it's inductance. So what we can do is apply this test method to measure both the inductance and the resistance of our inductor. And you can do this with a signal generator and an oscilloscope and then go frequency by frequency, all manual to see the exact amplitude difference and phase difference. Or you can use a piece of equipment called a network analyzer. Basically, it does the exact same thing. It generates multiple frequencies step by step and then proceeds to measure the amplitude difference and the phase difference at each test frequency. So basically it can perform a lot of measurements in a short amount of time without too much operator intervention. And one of the pieces of equipment that can achieve this function is the Analog Discovery 2. It's a really great piece of equipment. I might do a review on it. Let me know if you would be interested in that. But for now, let's perform this measurement, see exactly what we can get out of it. And this is basically the setup that I will be using to perform the measurement. I've got my analog discovery with a little board with BNC connectors connected to it. The waveform generator is connected to the power amplifier and this is driving my circuit. And then I have my two input channels which are connected to the circuit. First one is measuring exactly the signal that my signal generator is injecting. And the second one is measuring the signal on my test inductor. And the test inductor in this case is this 200 turn coil which is built on a transformer casing. So first of all, I will be measuring it with an air coil and afterwards I will be putting the transformer back together. So if we perform measurement, this is basically the interface that we get. We have our amplitude information on top and the phase information on the bottom. I'm performing a measurement from 10 Hertz up until 1.05 megahertz. It's okay. And I have 500 samples. Now, the measurement takes a while, especially at lower frequencies. Getting the phase and the amplitude information out of the measurement does take a while. And this is basically what we get. Now we can see some distinct information from this measurement already. So we can see here at low frequencies that the signals are just so small that the device can't even perform a proper measurement. But afterwards, we see the phase increasing towards 90 degrees, so a purely inductive behavior. At the same time, the amplitude of the signal is increasing at rate of 20 decibels per decade. Then we see this peak, after which the amplitude starts to decrease. Basically, this is where the equivalent parallel capacity of the inductor starts to come into play. So up until this point, the coil is an inductor. Afterwards, it behaves like a capacitor. So if we now take all this data, so all 500 points, plot it into a spreadsheet to be able to process it. I'm not going to process all this data by hand, of course. First of all, I have the two graphs, so the amplitude and the phase, exactly what we saw in the other program. And then if we take the formulas from the document and apply them, I can work out the impedance in every single point and then the ESR and the inductance. And if we go and plot these out, this is basically what we get. So we see our in impedance slowly rising up until the point where we have our resonance frequency. We see our inductance, which is well fuzzy at the beginning because of the small measurement value. So this isn't really accurate, but afterwards you can see it's perfectly flat. So there's no change in inductance up until this point where we have our resonance. So it goes from an inductor to a capacitor. Same thing on the ESR side. So we see our flat equivalent resistance. This is basically the wire resistance. And then if we plot all these out on the same graph, we see that the total impedance is caused by the reactance and the ESR. So again, at low frequencies, we can't really rely on the values, but we see the constant ESR and then the reactance, which is inductance really, rising at a constant rate. So no surprises until here. The inductor behaves as it's supposed to. But now if I add in the iron core, 
Let's see how the data will look. Building a transformer like this is quite a lot of fun, especially if you don't have the patience for it. It's quite a tedious process. So finally it's done. Let's remeasure now. Again, we have to wait. So one of the main things we are expecting to see is an increase in the inductance. So previously we had around 500 microhenry of inductance and by adding the core, we expect this to increase. So we can already see in the measurement that from very low frequencies, we start to see the change in amplitude and we get to the high phase shift quite early on. So we do see this increase in inductance, but as the measurement finishes off, we see that the curves don't really look as we would expect them to. So we see we do have this nice increase at 20 decibels per decade with the 90 degrees phase shift, but then it changes. So we see the phase shift decreasing and then we see as before the resonance point, but this period right before it looks a bit strange. So let's analyze this with the spreadsheet to see exactly what happened. So I created a new spreadsheet with the new data. Here we can see the graphs of the data that I just imported. And then if we move on to the process data, so we see this impedance varying just like we had our measurement. And now if we move on to the inductance, we see something's really strange. So we see our constant inductance much higher than before. So before it was 500 microhenry, this is 30 millihenry. So it's like 60 times more. But then after around one kilohertz, it drops off. Now if we move on to the ESR, we see at low frequencies mainly the wire resistance, but then this increases. So as our inductance is falling, the ESR is rising and it gets up to quite substantial values. And then on the combined graph, we see that at low frequencies, most of the contributor to the impedance is the reactance, so this X graph, and afterwards the major contributor is ESR. So the resistance of the wire doesn't change. It's the same wire, same copper, same 5, 6, 10 ohms. But what we're seeing here with ESR increase is the way in which the coil behaves. So when the coil behaves like an inductor, it takes energy from the circuit, stores it, and then gives it back. We see reactants. And then what we can see from the measurement is that at higher frequencies, the coil takes energy from the circuit, stores it, and then doesn't give it back anymore. So we have a purely resistive behavior. Just like a normal resistor takes energy, turns it into heat and removes it from the circuit. So what we can see with the iron core is that up until around 100 Hertz, even before that, we have the behavior that we really want to have in that we have mostly inductance and very little ESR, so only the wire. But at higher frequencies, we start to lose our inductance and losses increase. So this is basically why you don't see iron core transformers being used as transformers really above a few tens, maybe 100 hertz. Because after this point, the transformer simply loses most of the energy. It becomes very, very inefficient. Now, another way to look at this information to understand the behavior is by looking at the permeability of the magnetic material. Since we see two different behaviors brought on by adding the magnetic core to the inductor, the best way to look at permeability is to split it up into its complex components. On the one side, we have the real permeability, the one that brings the inductive behavior. And on the other side, we have imaginary permeability that brings the lossy resistive behavior. Now, for the particular case of iron or steel, I found this very nice research paper that actually focuses on analyzing the frequency dependence of permeability. Now, the exact material that was analyzed is not the one that I have in my transformer, but it's very similar, so we will see similar values. So based on the measurements presented in this research paper, what we can see is that the real permeability is fairly constant, close to one kilohertz, after which it drops off. And on the other side, the imaginary permeability starts rising close to 100 hertz. So this is very similar to what we obtained with our core. Now the problem of 
real and imaginary permeability is not something that is restricted to iron core. If we look at a good ferrite material datasheet, we will see the exact same curves. So what I have here is an example from a TDK EPCOS datasheet. Here they're analyzing the K10 material, but all of the materials will have these properties. Basically, what they're showing us here is how your real permeability, the solid line, and the imaginary permeability vary with frequency. So with this material, if you use it at low frequencies, it's predominantly inductive, but at higher frequencies, it will become predominantly resistive and lossy. So what's the difference between ferrite-based power components and ferrite-based filter components? Well, not much really. It all depends on the frequency at which you use them and the way in which the composition of the ferrite is fine-tuned to enhance either the inductive behavior or the resistive behavior. For a power component, you will most likely want the inductive behavior to have minimal losses, whereas for the filter component, you'll most likely want the resistive behavior because that way you will eliminate any sort of noise directly out of the circuit. You will not have to handle it like with an inductor. One more thing I want to show you is a ferrite datasheet. So what I have here is a ferrite datasheet from the manufacturer Morata and one of the informations present on this page is this impedance graph where we have a highlight of total impedance, resistive behavior and reactance. And here we can see just like with our iron core at low frequencies impedance is predominantly reactive caused by inductance Afterwards, it becomes predominantly resistive with a peak impedance. And finally, resistance will drop and the capacitive component kicks in. Now, depending on how you build your inductor, you will have these three distinct regions. So inductive, resistive and capacitive. Or if you have too many turns and too much capacity, then the resistive behavior will be very, very small or even non-existent. So you will go directly from the inductive behavior to the capacitive behavior. Now, there of course are a lot more parameters involved in inductor construction and behavior, but that is something for a different time. For now, hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.